Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2387. This week we're celebrating the Ren Sport Reunion 7. It takes place September 28th through October 1st at Laguna Seca Raceway and is celebrating the 75th anniversary of Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the iconic Porsche 911. Today, well, today we talk with a racer that <laughs> lives, eats, and breathes Porsche racing. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Southern California with a very special guest, actually a returning guest, but it's been a while since he's been here because he's been kind of busy by the name of Patrick Long. Patrick, welcome back to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I am ready. I am excited to be back and uh, talking with you. Absolutely. And I'm even more excited that I'm going to be seeing you in a few weeks down there at Laguna Seca at Rensport. This is like, oh, being a Porsche guy, one of my favorite events. And I know it is yours as well. And I'm going to give you an introduction here real quick because, you know, I'm sure all my listeners know who you are, but just to kind of set the tone. And then I want to touch on a little bit of all the things you've been doing because you just returned from the UK, uh, from Goodwood. Uh, you've been a busy man, but let me give you a little bit of a proper introduction. Patrick Long, along with his mentor and friend Alvin Springer, are co-grand marshals of this year's Porsche Rennsport Reunion 7. Patrick has become the personification of the spirit of Rennsport Reunion, the celebration of Porsche motorsports past, present, and future. Patrick raced karts at the age of eight when he started taking to the track, moved up through the ranks. He lived in Europe, and after a run at F1, he landed in a Porsche Super Cup as a junior, and he got a taste for GT cars and became a Porsche factory driver in 2004 until his retirement. But that didn't mean hanging up his helmet for Patrick. He's even busier nowadays, and I think he's having a lot more fun, too. Today, his calendar is filled with vintage racing, motorsports events around the world, a Porsche brand ambassador, ship, and his co-creation of Luftacult, which has become a huge success in events across the country. We'll be back in just a moment with Patrick, but first a word from our sponsors. So give them a little love. They keep the gas in the tanks here, and we'll be right back. Years ago, when it was time to renew my collector car insurance policy, my carrier's rates went up way up, but my usage was the same and I never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. So what's with that? So I turned to American Collectors Insurance. Has your collector car insurance recently raised your rates for no good reason? Tired of paying an annual membership fee? Then it's time to look around and call American Collectors Insurance. I shopped around, I asked friends for recommendations and found a winner that I can trust. And boy, I'm glad I did. I saved hundreds of dollars every year and slept better at night knowing my baby was properly insured. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting vehicles since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by their history of taking great care of their clients. What could be better than that? So give them a call and ask for a quote today. 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866 224 9324 and protect the ones you love like I did with American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. For several years now, you've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine. I've been a subscriber since the start. Their talented and creative team brings you a spectacular publication and website that shares the automotive passion from a worldwide perspective. Linkage is about driving, restoring, collecting, and firsthand experience at collector car auctions and more. They bring you real-world values plus rational, experienced opinions on the current markets. They cover the automotive world and the people who share our passions. And Linkage Magazine has grown, mailing you six issues annually. Join me on this journey with Linkage. They're geared for the automotive life. You can subscribe at LinkageMag.com. Did you know that Cars Yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership, according to Lipson, the premier RSS feed for podcasts in the United States? That's right. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts 
for you to enjoy. Cars yeah has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. And more and more listeners find Cars yeah every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique and very personal way? Well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyeah.com or through the website at carsyeah.com today to learn more. So, Patrick, uh, I know you're busy. Now, you just returned from Goodwood. I, I did a show with a guy last week while he was there. He took me on a little walk through the vintage airplanes there. Uh, what was that event like? And I saw on your Instagram uh, you did some racing there as well. Yeah, it was great to finally make it to my first Goodwood revival. I remember Danny Sullivan in the early 2000s telling me, you know, Danny's been a great mentor of mine all the way through from go-karts to today. And he said, you need to do this event. But the one note he gave me was, you need to wear the proper period dress. And (laughs) I think that really sets the tone for what an immersive experience the entire weekend is. The March family, they just go over the top and everybody there understands what it's all about. Driving was amazing. I'd never been on that racetrack, and I've seen plenty of videos of it, as most of you all have. And, and it's a pretty tricky and, and, and high-risk racetrack, so I had that on my mind. But I also just wanted to enjoy the festivities and the culture, and it certainly takes you back to such an epic period in motorsport and aviation. And, yeah, I loved every bit of it. I think I'm definitely uh, going to try to make every single year if I can. Well, no doubt. What car were you driving? I drove a 1965 911 two liter. There's a two liter championship that runs with the Peter Auto Group in Europe for the last few years, and it's very one make, uh, you know, FIA grade cars. Everybody's in the same spec, and I think we had almost 30 cars this cars. year out yeah. on the track. It yeah. was it was it was wild. We're running an old bias plied spec tire, and it means that there's lots of sideway actions. But um, I I love that. I I'm sort of a purist when it comes to vintage racing, and I think the closer you can run the cars to period spec, the better it is as as a, a spectacle for the fans. But also, it takes the drivers back to what it was like. It it makes little sense to put big modern adjustable shocks and radial tires on these little cars because they just they're on they're on rails at that point but certainly not the case this past weekend it was more opposite lock than anything well it was fun to watch and going back a little earlier in the year another event you attended and drove long beach historics in a williams fw uh what was that like yeah i mean driving K.K. Rosberg's car at Long Beach, you know, in the same spec and and actually the year, the last year that Formula One ran at Long Beach, if I'm not mistaken, K.K., another uh, great mentor of mine, someone I got to spend a lot of time with, uh, his son Nico and I shared the same kart team while living in Italy. And so it was an honor to sit in the, the cockpit of his car. Uh, not a small venture uh, driving those cars on the limit at a street track, but Long Beach is a place I know well. It's my home racetrack, and I had had the opportunity from Eric Joyner to drive his car, and it's it's hard to go out there and, and not want to really stand on the gas. The way those little Cosworths run, it's sort of full throttle or nothing. So it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, again, just check it off. Uh, a lot of bucket list experiences behind the wheel now that I'm not full-time pro racing, and have a few weekends to get out and and do events like this. So yeah, I mean, Long Beach was definitely a big highlight. Goodwood was a huge one. Uh, Monterey Reunion was fun this year. I did that in the Leighton House 962. Yeah, And then Rensport is just going to be over the top. I mean, people who have been to Rensport understand when I say that it's just four days of drinking from a fire hose, everything from static displays to cultured, you know, music events. And then of course the racing is just going to be jam packed. So um, hundreds of thousands of Porsche fans uh, all together at what is absolutely a reunion in, in Monterey. It's, it's super fun. And every time I am involved in rent sport, whether that's from the planning and advising standpoint or from competing, uh, I just think of Bob Carlson and, his vision of Ren Sport when it was first kicked off back in the days at Lime Rock. And it was really about celebrating the cast of characters and the cars and displaying those for the media and for the public and, and getting them out there, uh, not just parade laps, but real hardcore elbows up racing. It's, it's grown, of course, in exponential ways. But I always remember my friend Bob Carlson when uh, we go to Ren Sport because we really owe him a lot on the vision. 
Oh, absolutely. In fact, I'm going to be having Brian Redman on later this week, and he was one of the guys uh, with Bob who came up with the whole concept of this whole thing. And the last Ren Sport I was at, well, the last three I was at, actually, and I remember standing there with you watching that music festival and the the people on the stage, um, I mean, Harrison and and. You know, others. I just, I was going, this is just a cool event. And, and I want to talk more in depth about Ren Sport. But one thing I do want to mention here is Luftkult, because you and your co founder, Howie, have done an amazing thing with this. And you're going to be having a little, what you call a pop up, because I'm going to be celebrating the Chattanooga Motor Car Festival next week. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing there at Chattanooga? Yeah, it's event mania right now with, with <laughs> yeah. all these different events that we're kicking off. Yeah, second weekend of October uh, down in Chattanooga, uh, we're going to do a pop-up uh, where we do a small sort of sampling of what Lufka Cold and the spirit of Luft is all about. It's really about celebrating Brian this year. Uh, Brian and James will be there uh, with their event uh, at, at the Chattanooga Motor Festival. And I think that talking to Byron DeFore and the people who really put the event on, they wanted to add uh, a spirit of Luft, and so we're going to highlight three cars with lighting and staging, and then we're going to invite 100 cars to come in on the Friday night, and we're going to have a nice sort of toast to Brian, a little bit of Q&A on stage, going to have a guest uh, MC who oh, many of you will know. And uh, it's, it's just about, you know, spreading that message, especially to the next generation. I think when Lufka Colt was founded in 2014, I had purchased my first vintage Porsche streetcar, uh, a 1986 Carrera, and I just wasn't able to draw people in to come join some of these uh, different car events where I was bringing my 911. And I, I recognized that there was something missing to link the next generation or, or the non Porsche file to a static car display. And so it's really about creating an art show, but the art is the vehicles. And when you add in the food and the music, uh, the families, the festivities, the dogs, you name it, uh, it, it really took off in a, in a way that I never guessed. And it's just grown year on year. And really, uh, you know, with Jeff Sword and, and the team, we're just trying to keep up with the demand. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. amazing to see how much passion there is for the brand uh, for Porsche and, and especially the classics. I mean, everybody knows the love affair between Porsche and America. And we try to tell some of those stories, whether it's street cars or race cars, but also the characters behind it. You know, the late Vic Elford was a big part of our 2018 event. And so this year in Chattanooga, we thought it was a great time to bring a couple of special cars out that Brian Redman had raced and, and to really, you know, raise a glass to Brian. I mean, he is such a character, such a, a, a freak of nature when it comes to <laughs> storytelling. And um, when you really dig into what he's done on track, it's just legendary. Yeah, he's amazing. I'll tell you, he was an interesting guest the first time I had him on the show. He's been on several times and is going to be back this week. He sang the British birthday song because I interviewed him on his <laughs> birthday. You got to go back and listen to that because I'd never heard that before. And it's hilarious. It's self-deprecating, but it's really funny. And of course, who could be better than Brian to sing that? So let's get into Rensport a little bit here. Alvin Springer and you are the co-grand marshals. Tell our, li our listeners a little bit about Alvin Springer because he's such an icon at Porsche. Alvin is um, just an absolute pioneer. He started, you know, on the very deep ends of technical engine building, mechanical side, but he developed into so much more than that. Obviously, co-founder of Andial, and if you don't know Andial's story, uh, definitely look that one up. But yeah, yeah. Um, Porsche Motorsport North America has sort of grown. You know, once Al Holbert had unfortunately passed away, Alvin took the reins and, and really built Porsche Motorsport uh, into its own living, breathing world here in Southern California. And everything that Alvin's done has been about putting his neck on the line, uh, being a leader, whether that's leading teams of people, um, building and developing iconic race cars, uh, and just being the face of Porsche Motorsport in North America for so long. And even though he technically retired in 2004, uh, he's still going and very, very much involved. I speak to him weekly. Uh, I, I lean on him for advice. I hear advice from him even when I'm not asking for it. And we have a, a great relationship. He is such a, a, a human being in the most pure form of just says how he feels. Um, he's usually right and, and he wants to win. And I think that's what Porsche has is just some of these cast of characters um, who have been involved with motorsport for decade on decade on decade. And they're just racers through and through. 
Yeah, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I can't wait. Now, let's talk about some of the things that are going to be happening because this is four days of Porsche fanaticism. I mean, it's just, uh, I've been bringing my son with me this year, and we're both so excited because we're both big Porsche fans. But I want to walk through a few things. One thing that's coming this year, PCA Club Racing, which is going to be pretty cool. Are you going to be driving in any of these events? Um, I will be, yeah. I, I've served on the selection committee uh, for the last couple of Ren Sports, and along with guys like Andy Prill and Bruce Canapa and uh, a lot a lot of characters, Jeff Swart, I've learned so much about the history and the technical side of all these different cars and eras and classes, and it's really been about curating the very best examples of these race cars from all different eras, and that's the fun, is getting these cars in their right period liveries with the legitimate history. There are no build-ups. There are no replicas. This is all about celebrating the real racing motorsport and heritage of Porsche. To answer your question, I'll be driving in a few different cars. Uh, I think in 2018, I jumped in seven or eight different cars in some capacity, including a a, a Porsche Junior Tractor from uh, 1959. And I think yeah. that was one of the favorite races yeah. of the whole weekend was the uh, tractor races, yeah. including the standing start. But this year, I'll be mainly focused on an inner scope 934 and a half, a uh, big turbo 911. For those of you who don't know the 934 and a half, but such a a storied past in that car and and why it was built and what it was built for but it was sort of an outlaw it was a car that was rejected by a lot of sanctioning bodies because it was really a gray area in the rule book and so i love jumping into these cars and trying to tame them around the track. I'll also be driving that same Leighton House 962 that I mentioned that I drove at the Rolex reunion in August and um you know the 962 is sort of a a racing driver's dream because there is so much grip, there is so much power, there's braking, there's so much capability out of that car that you never actually extract 100% of the performance of the car because you just can't physically, mentally, um, maybe my talent doesn't allow me, but it, it's just a car that, that every single lap, you're trying to just tame it. And, and I, I don't have a better descriptor than that, but it's, it's like w- riding a wild horse with, with no saddle. You're just holding on and trying to get it aimed in the right direction and then you let it loose. But um, yeah, I look forward to um, all the different sort of categories of of exhibition laps parade laps it's very much a family affair as you mentioned the pca will have a one run group where they have kind of a, a few different classes inside of that but we've we've sort of narrowed that scope this year as the advisory committee and the selection committee and so i think they're mainly focused on sort of 70s 80s 90s and you'll see a lot of spec boxers 928s and really the spirit of pca club racing those cars are mainly street cars that have been built into race cars And we love that. We love to just tell all the different stories of different types of racing that Porsche has done or or does currently in in North America. Oh, absolutely. I wanted to ask you your opinion of the new track surface there at Laguna Seca after running at the Rolex Motorsports Reunion. Because this past weekend, an IndyCar set a new track record. And I heard a lot of the drivers talking about they were going faster than they had been. What was your impression of that new surface? Yeah, I was concerned I always am concerned when a racetrack is repaved that, you know, angles or curbs or bumps disappear Mm -hmm. from what you knew of the racetrack. And I was pleasantly surprised that it is still 100% in its entirety Laguna Seca. And I call it Laguna Seca, but Weather Tech Raceway uh, gets a nod for being the track sponsor there. Just very quick. Still some character with little bumps and angles and cambers, but absolutely set records at at the reunion we went many seconds faster in most cars that i jumped into and smooth and fast i i haven't watched the indycar race because i was on my way back yesterday from the uk i I don't know how high grip modern tires and downforce really will change the track surface compared to how it was when i drove it in august it was still pretty green at that point but Mm -hmm. It had a lot of grip on and offline, and it was it was great to drive the 962. But with with that new surface, yeah, you're always going to have less tire degradation. You're going to have 
quicker speeds, more cornering forces. So I, yeah, look forward to the sore neck after the first race <laughs> in the 962. Yeah, no kidding. One thing I heard a lot of the vintage racers saying they didn't have the uh, the tire lines to use as guides through the track for people that were not professional drivers, and they kind of got lost a few times on the track because, like, where are those marks that have been there forever to kind of guide you through some of the corners, especially for vintage racers that don't get out there as much. But uh, yeah, it looks marvelous. So you guys are going to have some fun. A couple of other things they do at Rinsport that are very cool. Uh, one is they have vintage Porsche racing uh, legends there. There's going to be a lot of people like yourself and others. Hurley, no doubt, will be there. Perhaps Jackie Hicks will be back. Porsche family members. There's so many cool people to show for this, including engineers and people from the past in the Porsche world. Yeah, it's sort of uh, Porsche Disneyland. It's, <laughs> it's hard to walk five feet without running into a legend. And I think that that's Really, that initial vision um, that Bob and, and the Redmonds had was bringing the legends and the heroes out, the personalities, and celebrating them as much as the cars. I, I hear some race series or racetracks say the cars are the stars, but I don't necessarily agree with them because without the human stories and without the legendary drivers that, that jumped into these cars and won Le Mans and Daytona and Sebring and the list goes on, it, it, it doesn't connect the, the human aspect to it. So yeah, I really love uh, how much effort Porsche Cars North America has put into bringing out all different types of leaders and drivers and engineers and, and story makers, media members. It's, it's all about that entirety of the story. And people bring out their old clothes, their old Porsche racing jackets. And for people who haven't been before, it, it's just an education and it's a full immersion. And I think that it's very welcomed and set up for all ages, all levels of people who understand uh, Porsche and its history. And it's, it's just a full immersion into the world that that we all love and i mean it's it's hard to argue that porsche carries maybe the best if it's not one of the best um sort of lineages in motorsport and it's always been part of the dna at porsche and you'll see that uh live and in front of your face uh, like you said uh board members and and the porsche family being on site it really is special and i i do love that it's four sometimes five years between each rent sport because it allows for so much storyline to be developed and you will see a lot of modern product out there including the new you know, Penske 963 that races in IMSA and WEC. So it's not just old drivers and old cars. It's the modern uh, as well. And then there'll be some really radical and special world premieres of, of street cars. As you mentioned, music, festivities, uh, lots of shopping, lots of food. Uh, it, it, there's a little bit of everything. I'm glad it's four days because even in four days, uh, it's hard to see everybody, talk to everybody, and experience everything that they have on the grounds there at Laguna Seca. But uh, that's it's sure, sure better than two days. Oh, they do it right, for sure. And you mentioned families. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to bring bring my son. I started taking him to Car Week and he was eight years old. He's about to turn 30, which makes me very old. Oh my gosh. But we're going to have some fun. They do some real fun things like they're going to have a movie night, the Transformers movies, Rise of the Beast, which of course has the Porsche 911 in it. They're going to have music. Uh, now, I had Frank Wiesman on yesterday from Porsche North America. They wouldn't tell me who's going to be singing, but like last time, there's going to be some big names out there. So to bring the whole family is is really what makes this great. I also understand uh, you, you mentioned new cars now porsche is going to be unveiling something special that nobody will tell me yet and i understand that but also mission x uh some of the other cars that they've come out with lately so being an ambassador for porsche you get to see some of this stuff and how it's transitioning. And I wanted to ask your opinion of this, you know, with the onset of EV cars coming in and kind of be being a little bit crammed down our throats, I feel like sometimes, but Porsche seems to be handling it really nicely the way they're integrating some of the cars. I know we're going to be seeing the Cayman and Boxster, the 718 come into electric, the, the Macan and so forth. What's, what's your opinion of what's happening in the car world when it reflects on EVs? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. And I think that what Porsche does so well is they connect their roots and their current model line of streetcars or race cars mm -hmm. with the evolution of technology and the electrification. And a couple of examples is like when I started in the GT3R hybrid, it was really the first time that I had seen or, or been around a, a hybrid race car of any capacity and driving that car and just understanding how innovative it was and how radical it was to drive, how linear the power delivery was, how we were running 
active all-wheel drive with electric front wheels and combustion rear wheels, or when you look at the 918 as a streetcar, as a hypercar, and the start of that whole period of electric and combustion. And now to go to the next step, um, being that of all electric, uh, there is some really, really cool technology in all of it. And I know that some of the purists don't quite agree or love it, but as far as driving experience, as far as the numbers and the technology, the efficiency, and of course the lap times, it's hard to argue with, but I'm still old school. I still uh, enjoy my air-cooled vintage Porsches, but I also am fortunate to drive a Taycan um, on the street. And, And it's funny within the family, when we jump in a car to go to go to dinner, that's the car my wife wants to drive. That's the car my kids want to jump into because yeah. it's just a fun car. So, yeah, there's there's a little bit of it all for everybody. And I think that it's really understanding how it works in motorsport, not only from a performance standpoint, but also just developmentally um, from a reliability side, from making things lightweight and efficient, um, being easy on the tires and easy on the brake. One of the things I love that Porsche does is they get the, the weight down so low. I mean, they go through and through further than any anybody out there in really understanding where the battery weight should live and how it, how it works on track, how it works on the street. And it's not just about numbers and efficiency, but, but getting the most out of the performance. And they're willing to spend that time and that money to develop a car and to go further than just strapping batteries onto an existing platform. So every time I get to drive one of these cars, I come in, maybe less excited than when I leave. And, and that's the brutal truth. It's, it always surprises me. And I think that that's been the best part of these last two decades working with this company is, is that yes, they are designers. Yes, they are um, really about creating visually stunning product, but in the end, they're about performance and engineering. And I say in any type of business or in any experience that you have with product or, or even events, if you have an intersection of engineering and creativity and design, and there's form and function, you know you're going to love it. And, and it's always fun to debate why people love Porsche cars and the experience that they give and that the brand gives. And that's always my answer is, tell me a, a restaurant that has a brilliant chef who also runs a brilliant business and you're going to love that experience. And I really think that's what embodies the Porsche product. Uh, you said it really well. During Car Week, uh, I rented for the first time a Tesla to kind of see what it was like. And I ran into a listener of cars, yeah. And I was telling him, you know, I, I like it more than I thought I would. And he said, come over here. I'll let you drive my car. And he let me jump in his Taycan. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, uh, I think he's changing my opinion a little bit, especially after having a dozen 911s in my life over the years as daily drivers. Uh, yeah, I think there's a place for both. And uh, I'm excited by the future for sure, especially what Porsche is doing. You know, I wanted to, before I let you go today, I wanted to touch on just a couple of things with you. One is uh, what I always share with my my listeners is a special vehicle story. Now, you were on the show about eight years ago. So I wanted to ask you if you could pick one car out of your past. And I'm going to exclude, well, no, I'm not going to do that for you because you're a racer, including race cars. Is there one car that still in your mind stands out as a, oh, wow? Oh, there's many. Uh, <laughs> I'm fortunate to are. make my living behind the, the steering wheel. I'm going to pick one and just tell a little story. Um, it. This car has a name called Wester, and it's a little silver 1958 356. And I saw this car in 2016 at Luft, and it just was the only car that I was really walking in circles and coming back to every two hours to just take it all in. And I was fortunate enough to be able to own that car for a few years after I first saw it. But the the story of the human and the car is what really, um, you know, sold me through and through and and this gentleman's name was pascal and him and his wife found this 356 in an ebay ad up in northern california they were from san diego they drove all the way up sight unseen after winning the auction to buy this car and they didn't realize that they needed to bring their gardening tools and their weed whackers to dig the thing out of a field there was grass over the roof the roof height of the car and pascal in his french accent told me that he barely made it back to San Diego. Like they were, they were pulling off and fixing things on their journey, their eight hour drive South. And 
Pascal in his little humble garage with a great technical ability and, and, and experience level with these 356s mechanically restored this car, but the body was completely patinaed. The paint was chipping and peeling off. There was rust. It was a solid metal car, but everything else was just, I mean, people used to stop me at the gas station when I owned the car and ask me if I was going to restore this car. And I told him it is restored. Mm -hmm. um, so he preserved the entirety of the body, but went through everything mechanically, restuffed the seat, put in a nice period leather um, that, that had some had some prior life existence and it just it was like that jacket that you wear that just yeah. fits and you just go to it every single time and so i loved my time with that car i know where it is now it's with a great friend in trent abbott in omaha and i uh i keep an eye on it i miss it and and i loved all my drives i used to put in massive hours in that car i would drive it thousand miles at a time and um great road trips and experiences in that car and and just it's a, it's another one of those examples where the human and the stories that they tell and then passing the car to you as the next sort of custodian. It, it, it's just so fun. And it's the automotive experience that I love. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. I remember pictures of that when you got that car and I didn't know you'd let the thing go. A, a 58 356 has been my dream car forever because I was born in 58. So it kind of makes sense. They become just crazy price those cars uh which is kind of sad but my dream would always be to have our our mutual friend uh mr emery uh take one and build something special out of it um maybe one of these days i'll uh, i'll have him do that for me here's a bit of a car psychology test for you patrick i'm gonna crawl into your head a little bit here if you were reincarnated as a vehicle now this isn't what you want to be though that's too easy you got to look in the mirror real deep who you are as a guy as a racer as a car fanatic an enthusiast what car would you be, but more importantly, why? Ooh. Um, <laughs> how about a 930 Turbo? I like 930 Turbos because they're sort of, you're, you're unsuspecting. They draw you in. They're interesting. Um, but then when you drive them, uh, they, there's an evolving experience. And when the <laughs> yeah. boost comes on, uh, you know, you get, you get a, a little different power curve. Um, but they're also fun to just live uh, around and and uh, be with and they don't always have to be flat out but um yeah 930s are are a car that i had on my wall as a kid and um i think they give everybody a, a great experience well me too i'm happy you got a big smile on my face because my listeners know i had a 930 for about 14 years i sold it last summer like wester for you there's a time where the car goes to the next caregiver the car lives about 40 minutes north of me now and the new owner said mark Orange Crush will always be your car. Come and see it anytime. It's just living in a bigger garage with a lot of other Porsches <laughs> right now, which is cool. You know, what they do we like here are books. And I'm wondering if they're, with all your traveling, I'm assuming maybe you read books or listen to audio books. Is there a, a great book you might share with us? doesn't have to be about cars. Um, I'm in the Porsche spirit and the Rensport spirit. I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners, or, or probably even your uh, your, your subjects, have, have named this book, but... Um, I'm thinking about Mark Donahue this month, um, and The Unfair Advantage is just such a great, great read. If you haven't read it, uh, do it, because it just tells so much about who Mark was and how him and Roger Penske went racing and leaned on every single aspect of performance, and uh, lo love that book. It's a great book, for sure. So before I let you go today, could you share maybe some parting words of inspiration as a retired racer who's not hung up his helmet, is out there busier than ever, having fun in life? Maybe a success quote or some words of inspiration for all of us uh, Porsche fanatics who are going to be fortunate enough to be at Rensport. Sure. The word that's sort of sticking out to me in this kind of period where I am in my life is purpose. Um, what your purpose is, and what your truth is and what you're setting out to do and accomplish and who you spend time with and what, what you do in your life. Um, there's so much media out there. There's so much influence. There's so many people that are projecting uh, what they, they need to project for their own reasons, whether that's business or not. In the end, if you quiet all the noise and you uh, really ask yourself what you're setting, sitting here and set out to do, uh, it's pretty simple. And you follow that and, and everything seems to take shape and fall into place a little bit easier. So, you know, from, from my side, um, stepping out of the race car after 30 years on the road was a really difficult decision. And some people um, had a lot of opinion about my timing and, and why I did what I did. And, 
you know, it had to do with family. It had to do with a uh, personal purpose and what I was setting out to do. And I wanted to accomplish things that I wasn't able to accomplish because I was dedicated to my sport and everything that I had to do to be at the top of my game. And so I decided to change direction at 40 years of age and, and start my next chapter and, and, my new career. And I didn't really know, I didn't have any guarantees or promise that it was going to be the right decision. And I well could have been walking away from one of the most prized opportunities in, in motorsport, but it's, it's going well here two years later. Um, I'm figuring it out. I'm, I'm essentially, uh, uh, my own boss. And every day I wake up and figure out how I'm going to put food on the table. And, and that's uh, what I love is that I'm in, I'm in control of my own destiny and I've got to just grind it out. And uh, I know that's what you do. And, and so many people do every single day. So hopefully um, when you're sort of at those crossroads and you, you're thinking about a little bit of a step off the ledge and, and trying something new or, or meeting somebody different, whatever it might be, uh, you know, you know, in your gut, if you're, if you're heading in the direction of your purpose, I believe. Well said. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. So listeners, a Rensport Reunion 7 takes place September 28th to October 1st at Laguna Seca Raceway. Join Patrick and I and all the guests from this week and all the thousands of people that are going to be there. Rensport is amazing. You can find and get tickets at PorscheRensportReunion.com. Also, if you want to follow Patrick, he's got a great Instagram page at PL Motorsports. You can see what he's up to and see all the fun that he's having. And of course, you got to check out Luftecult if you're going to be at the Chattanooga Motor Car at the pop-up they're having there or just go to Luftecult. I'll put links to all these on Patrick's show notes page. Patrick, thanks for uh, literally pulling over, taking a pit stop with me today and your busy schedule. I cannot wait to see you at Rensport. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you at the Rensport Reunion 7. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. We'll see you up there. All right, my friend. Take care. If you're listening to this program, there's a pretty good chance you believe what I believe, that the collector vehicles we love are more than just a means of getting from one place to the other. They're a part of our culture, our identity, and as a people, They bring us together at vintage races, classic car auctions, and thousand mile rallies. That's why I support the RPM Foundation, which exists to ensure that the critical skills necessary to preserve and restore these important vehicles aren't lost to time. RPM stands for Restoration, Preservation, and Mentorship. And their goal is to inspire the next generation of vehicle restoration professionals through its outreach programs. And they include Shop Hop, Off to the Races, the RPM Future Class, and many others. These programs engage talented young people across the country and connect them with mentors and a variety of opportunities in the industry. For more information on how the RPM Foundation is driving the future of collector vehicles skill trade, visit rpm.foundation today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to carsyeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!